good evening everyone um, welcome to this event thank you so much for joining us um, today we are going to get to see the dr jenna house along with owen grower before i get into uh, before i introduce owen to all of you um, i'd just like to mention for those of you who are joining us for the first time we're science gallery bengaluru science gallery bengaluru is a research based institution for public engagement um, we are we are we have been supported by the government of Karnataka and our institutional partners are the Indian Institute of Science, National Center for Biological Sciences and Shrishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology. Please uh, join me in welcoming Owen. Um, Owen is a museum professional and historian. As general manager at Dr. Jenner's house, the former home of vaccine pioneer Edward Jenner, he is responsible for leading the development of the museum and its activities. He has a keen interest in vaccination and regularly speaks on its history, the eradication of smallpox and the life of Edward Jenner. Before uh, I pass on the mic to Owen, I'd like to remind you all that we will have a small Q&A session uh, right after Owen takes us through the Jenner house. So please remember to uh, type in your questions in the Q&A box and we will relay them to Owen. Uh, thank you all for joining us once again, and over to you, Owen. Thank you so much, Ganatri, and thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining us. Um, I'm coming live to you from Dr. Jenna's house, from the study here, um, where Jenna did so much of his work. And um, this, is, this is, I think, the first time we've, we've done this. So I really hope that it, it works, but I'm sure that the, the team from Science Gallery Bengaluru will uh, tell me if there are any problems. Um, I wanted to introduce you a little bit to, to our work, our broader work, before we go into the guided tour around Dr. Jenner's house. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully a PowerPoint presentation. Perfect, that's, that's where we are. So the, the Jenner Trust is, um, is a charitable organization, an independent charity. Our work is, is very broad, but all focuses around this building, which is called the Chantry. Um, we preserve it for the world, that's our purpose. And I'll tell you more about why we preserve it for the world, and why it's so vital that we continue to do that. Uh, and it's a base from which we celebrate the ongoing legacy of Edward Jenner and encourage others to follow in his footsteps. This is important. In the middle of a global pandemic, we know that scientific literacy, understanding medical history, understanding the developments that have come before us is really, really vital in making sense of the world, in making informed decisions about whether we get a vaccination, whether we um, accept to wear masks in certain, certain circumstances. Uh, and so understanding that history, but also it inspires the future. and we're really keen to continue that legacy of Edward Jenner, ensuring that vaccination is something that's, that's not just current now, but we can really inspire and excite the vaccine scientists of the future. We try and have um, values that are based on Edward Jenner's own values. We love to question the world around us. We work with others to do more than we could achieve alone. We do everything based on rigorous research. And, and in a little while, I'll tell you a bit more about some of our ongoing work and our attempts to better understand the story that we tell here in the museum. Our story is for everyone and we keep going in the face of adversity. And given the uh, technical issues that I've, we've had over the past couple of days trying to get this working for you, I, I'd say we're definitely trying to keep going in the face of adversity. We want to work together as a world, and it is real delight to be here on the banks of the River Severn in Gloucestershire in the, in the rural part of the United Kingdom, presenting to you, I think mostly in, in India, but also around the world, just being able to do that. It's um, 12.30 in the morning here. I know it's much later in the day for you. Um, the sun is, is shining. It's, it's really fantastic to, to be here. We, try and work together to foster beneficial collective inquiry. We celebrate vaccination from the place where it began, and we want to inspire current and future scientists. And I think with that, I will swap my screens around 
and show you the tour of Dr. Jen's house. We wanted to try and do this live, but it's a it's an old building and the Wi-Fi coverage is quite patchy. So we've pre-recorded this, but as I say, I'm coming to you from Edward Jenner's study. And at the end, I'm looking forward to taking your questions and to having a conversation with you. And again, from, from this really special historic place. Welcome to Dr. Jenner's house. We're standing here in the hallway of Dr. Jenner's house also called the Chantry. This beautiful Queen Anne style country townhouse was built in the early 1700s. It's in the centre of the market town of Berkeley in Gloucestershire on the banks of the River Severn, about halfway between Bristol and Gloucester. We're surrounded by the countryside, surrounded by rolling fields, the River Severn on our doorstep, and the town of Berkeley itself is wonderfully historic. It's got an ancient castle, it's got a Norman church. This house is, is wonderful and really interesting in its own right, but what makes it incredibly special is not what it is, but what happened here and who lived here in the later 1700s. And to understand that, to understand that story, we need to go back in time to the early years of a virus, two particular strains of a virus, variola major and variola minor. And these both caused the disease which was known throughout the world as smallpox. In its worst form, variola major, smallpox could kill up to 30% of those people it had infected. In the 18th century, it was a leading cause of blindness. If you survive smallpox, then you could go on to have severe lifelong scarring. And as many as one in three of the people who survived smallpox would have had quite significant scarring as a result of the disease. It takes its name from the characteristic pock marks that tend to be on the outer parts of the body, the, the extremities, the limbs. It can affect the face, it can scar the cornea, it can go all the way through the body and it really is one of the most, I think one of the most horrific and, and most feared diseases of all time. But there's one thing about smallpox that people started to realise from quite early on is that if you contracted it once then it was widely understood that you would be free, you would be immune from smallpox, you would be protected from smallpox for the rest of your life. And that came to be very, very important. People have tried throughout history to, to cure smallpox, to look at ways in which, which it could be, could be stopped once it had caused the infection. And, and that all goes back to different understandings of why people would contract smallpox. In some cultures, it was believed that smallpox was caused by a deity uh, and therefore offering appeasement to that deity would, would enable you to be free of the smallpox. Some people believed that it was just something present in every person, that the pustules were the body's way of expelling the disease. Uh, and others believed that it, it was just something that had to be endured. But there were other methods tried. Uh, in some cultures, people were bound very, very tightly in red cloth. People might be put into very hot rooms to try and sweat out the smallpox. Some people might be put in very cold rooms. Uh, and all these different treatments, all these different cures were tried throughout history, but to no avail really, because even now smallpox has no cure. But we know that prevention is better than cure. Uh, and so that idea that once you've had smallpox, you wouldn't contract it again, started to, to form the basis of a way of preventing smallpox that really would go on to change the world. So what we start to see for perhaps hundreds of years in parts of India, parts of China, parts of the Middle East, um, Turkey in particular, we, and, and parts of Western Africa as well, we see people deliberately infecting them, 
themselves with what they understood to be a mild dose of smallpox in a controlled way. And it was hoped that hoped and expected that by doing this, they would have the disease, but not in its more severe form, and then they would be protected for life from smallpox. And this practice became known in Western medicine as inoculation or engrafting, sometimes called variolation after the Latin variola, variola major, variola minor. It travels to America in the early 1700s. In 1706, an enslaved man called Onesimus was given as a gift to a preacher, the Reverend Cotton Mather in Boston. He told his owner about a practice that he had had as a child where he was deliberately infected with smallpox so that he would never have smallpox again in the wild. Later, when there was an outbreak of smallpox in Boston in 1721, Cotton Mather shared this knowledge with a medic who then was able to, to gradually, uh, and, and with quite a lot of backlash, start to introduce this to the medical establishment in Boston. At the same time, around 1721, the practice was introduced in England, in London. It came through Lady Mary Wortley Montague. She herself had had smallpox when she was a young woman. She knew the horror of the disease. She was very keen to find ways to protect her children from it. And so when her husband, as the Turkish ambassador, went to Constantinople, to Istanbul, to carry out his work, she followed and went with him. And it was there that she was able to have her child inoculated to be infected with smallpox. When she came back to London, she convinced society through a series of experiments that this was something that, that really was important, that people should try and learn about and people should be inoculated. Um, and so gradually, the practice of inoculation, which had started in various countries around the world, started to be accepted in medicine in Europe, in England, in the United States. It was effective. It certainly does seem to have reduced cases of smallpox, but it did have problems. And the one big problem is that you were infecting people with live smallpox. It required the continued existence of the virus to protect against the virus. And people could be infected with it. They would be variolated, inoculated, and then they would go around and, and walk and meet their friends. Uh, and unwittingly, they were spreading the virus. And there are instances of other of outbreaks being caused by people being inoculated, but not isolating for long enough afterwards. So it was, it was effective. It started to make real change, but it wasn't without its problems. And it's into this story that we introduce the owner of this house, Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner was born here in the Gloucestershire market town of Barclay in 1749. At the age of eight, when he started school, he was inoculated, again, exposed to smallpox in a deliberate and controlled way. But his experience was common of the type of experience that many people that being inoculated in England at the time would have, would have gone through, where he was not just infected with smallpox, but beforehand he was starved, he was bled, he was given a special diet. And that whole combination of experience that made the practice more acceptable in the eyes of people who subscribe to the, the Galenic view of medicine, that whole procedure is said to have really deeply affected and traumatised Edward Jenner for the rest of his life. And it's no surprise that really, as he went through his studies, as he became an apothecary surgeon, as he studied in London under John Hunter, the, the pioneer of experimental surgery, 
it's, it's no real surprise that he had this thought at the back of his mind that there must have been a better way, there must have been a different way. We're not too sure where Edward Jenner first heard that the idea that the cowpox, which was a completely different disease related to smallpox, but which was normally a disease of cattle. We don't know where he first heard that cowpox could prevent smallpox. It may have been a country tradition. It may have been something that farmers and dairy maids who were milking cattle realised. It may have been something that perhaps started to be noticed as inoculation was being practised in, in wider parts of, of Britain, where they were attempting to inoculate farm workers to find that actually they couldn't infect them with smallpox. But what became gradually known, and seems to have been known by quite a few people, or, or at least understood by quite a few people, is that cowpox could provide protection against smallpox. So this completely different disease could provide protection against the feared smallpox. The cowpox is, as I say, a, a, mostly a disease of cattle, but when it does affect humans, it's very mild. It might cause some swelling on the site of infection. You might have a fever, but it clears up very quickly. You're not left with the lifelong scarring, and there's, there's very little chance of severe illness. So Jenna, I think, started to believe that this could be a solution. This could be a way of protecting people from smallpox without everything that went with inoculation. But he wanted to try it. He needed to try it scientifically. And he needed to prove as well that you could take cowpox from a cow, give it to a human, and then give it to another human. And so he started to gather anecdotal evidence. He started to find cases of people who had been infected with cowpox and who believed that they had then come into contact with smallpox but not been infected. Jenna needed to know, needed to be able to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that cowpox could protect against smallpox. So having gathered the anecdotal evidence, he needed a test subject. He needed first a person, a patient with cowpox, but then he also needed someone who he knew had neither had cowpox nor smallpox. For this experiment, he selected an eight-year-old boy called James Phipps. Phipps was the son of Edward Jenner's gardener. Jenner knew him, he knew his medical history. He knew that he had not had smallpox or cowpox and knew that he would be an ideal subject for this, this experiment. And so on the 14th of May, 1796, Jenner took fluid from the pustule, the cowpox pustule, on the hand of Sarah Nelms. And he, using a lancet, scratched it into the arm of James Phipps. This was what we now widely regard as the first scientifically led vaccination to have ever taken place. Phipps contracted cowpox, his arm swelled up, he had a fever, but after a few days he was feeling absolutely fine. But Jenner needed to go a step further, he needed to prove that cowpox could protect against smallpox. And so he then attempted to inoculate James Phipps to introduce smallpox to him. But the smallpox didn't take. Phipps remained free of smallpox. And in this experiment, Jenner had shown for the first time, proved scientifically, that cowpox could protect against smallpox. He didn't stop there. He continued to attempt to infect Phipps with smallpox again and again. Then he went and found other cases, other subjects who he could first inoculate with cowpox, and then he could attempt to inoculate with smallpox. He referred to cowpox as the variolae vaccinae, the smallpox of the cow in Latin. And from that, he then started talking about vaccine inoculation, which was then contracted to vaccination.
We tell this story in Edward Jenner's dining room. It's a long room, it's got a bay window that looks out over Edward Jenner's garden. And in all of the cases around this room, we have objects from Jenner's life. We have personal family objects, Edward Jenner's spectacles, Edward Jenner's books that were owned by Edward Jenner's father. We have christening gowns relating to the family. We've got objects relating to John Hunter. And then finally, we have lances that were owned by Edward Jenner and used by Edward Jenner. Surgical blades, which Jenner used for the first ever vaccinations. And we also have a copy of Jenner's 1798 publication, The Inquiry. And this is what he used to tell the world about vaccination. He wrote down all of his findings, all the evidence that he had gathered to prove that vaccination was effective against smallpox. He published it himself, and then he sent it out to people in all parts of the world so that they too could know how to vaccinate. And it's beautifully illustrated with things like the illustration of Sarah Nelm's hand. Sarah Nelm's, the dairymaid from whom Jenna took the material for that first vaccination of James Phipps. And behind me as well, we have a portrait of Blossom the cow. Blossom supposedly is the cow who infected Sarah Nelm's with cowpox. Blossom has been memorialized in this painting by one of Edward Jenner's nephews that we now have on display in a room that Edward Jenner knew and loved and had probably all sorts of interesting conversations in. Through his publication of The Inquiry, Edward Jenner was able to spread this practice of vaccination throughout the world. And here in what was at one point an upstairs bedroom in Jenner's house, but we now call the eradication room. We chart that story of vaccination traveling around the globe and ultimately culminating in the eradication of smallpox by 1980. Before we get to that, of course, there are many stories associated with that early history of vaccination. The first recorded vaccination on the Indian subcontinent took place on the 14th of June, 1802. The person to be vaccinated was a three-year-old girl called Anna Dusthall. She was recorded, re widely regarded as being the first of many. By 1807, more than a million Indians and Sri Lankans had been vaccinated. But vaccination was not universally accepted, not universally adopted, and in British India it came to be seen as very much a, a tool of colonial expansion and colonial power, and, and indeed it, it was. There are perhaps others better placed to tell that story and other stories from the history of vaccination around the world. We're working hard to incorporate those stories into the museum. Because whilst we know that vaccination is a common good, there is no denying that the history of vaccination is rife with tales of abuse, of power dynamics at play. For full and complex histories, we need to explore those stories and we need to tell those stories. In the 20th century, people worldwide were still dying of smallpox. One figure often quoted is that 300 million people died of smallpox in the 20th century alone. It became apparent that a global effort would be needed. And so from the 1960s onwards, organised 
at country level, but also overseen at uh, global level by the World Health Organization, people around the world started to work together to combat the threat of smallpox. And they had a number of tools at their disposal. New technologies such as the bifurcated needle, uh, a very small needle with a double pronged end that could hold a single vial of a single dose of smallpox vaccine and could be used with very little training. They had freeze dried vaccines that were heat stable and could be used in remote parts of the world without easy access to refrigeration facilities. Manufacturing took place around the world and people worked together in a coordinated effort to find cases of smallpox, to vaccinate people in the surrounding area and to continue looking. Surveillance was absolutely crucial to ensuring that smallpox could be defeated because smallpox has no animal reservoir. So if you can stop that chain of transmission from human to human to human, then you can stop smallpox in its tracks. And so in 1975, we saw the world's last case of variola major, the, the more severe form of smallpox. It was a little girl called Rahima Banu, and she lived on Bola Island in Bangladesh. In 1977, we saw the world's last case of variola minor. That was a Somali chef called Ali Mal Malin. He also worked as a hospital porter. Both Rahima and Ali Malmalin both survived. In 1978, there was a laboratory-based outbreak of smallpox here in the UK in Birmingham, and a medical photographer called Janet Parker lost her life. This was to be the last ever outbreak of smallpox. By 1979, the World Health Organization was satisfied that smallpox was no more. There had been no other reported cases of smallpox. And in 1980, the World Health Assembly made the historic declaration that the world and all its peoples have won freedom from smallpox. Smallpox is no more, the first and to date the only human disease to have been completely wiped out around the world. And that is thanks to vaccination. Edward Jenner's work still continues. Smallpox is dead, but inspired by Jenner, building on Jenner's work, we now have vaccinations for so many different diseases that were once a source of pain and misery to so many people. We have vaccination against polio, diphtheria, measles, and now COVID-19. Vaccination worldwide saves between two and three million lives each and every year. Our struggle against infectious disease continues, but vaccination is one of our most powerful tools, and indeed one of our most cost-effective tools. So the story which starts in various parts of the world through inoculation in India, in China, in Turkey, in Africa, which is adapted and transformed by Edward Jenner here in Berkeley in Gloucestershire into vaccination, and then has been taken by vaccinators, people who work in logistics, vaccine scientists. It all has contributed towards the picture that we see today, which is that lives are being saved worldwide, and we hope that many, many more lives can be saved. A real tribute to the legacy of Edward Jenner. This rustic thatched hut at the top of Edward Jenner's garden was originally designed as a summer house, but Edward Jenner had a better use for it. He called it the Temple of Vaccinia, and it was here after church every Sunday that he invited people from the local area to come and be vaccinated against smallpox. You see, we think that Jenna didn't just come up with a vaccine. Jenna came up with the principles that we now associate with vaccination. He was committed to 
everyone being able to receive it, no matter who they were, whether they could afford it or not, vaccination was to be free of charge and available to anyone here at Jenner's Temple of Vaccinia. He wanted it to be global. He wrote to people around the world. He even corresponded with countries with whom Britain was at war. He was determined that science should have no borders. And so he committed to vaccination from its very earliest days being a global effort. And he never sought to profit from it. He wanted to ensure that anyone could vaccinate. He gave people the skills to vaccinate in their local area. He wrote to people telling them how to identify cowpox. He would send samples of cowpox to people so that they could perform vaccination themselves. Jenner didn't go on these mass vaccination tours. He vaccinated here in his local area with people who he knew and people who trusted him as their local country doctor. That model, that network of trusted local practitioners is still at the heart of vaccination programs today. The final stop on our tour of Dr. Jenner's house is here, Edward Jenner's study, it's recreated as it was at the time of his death in 1823. We're surrounded by objects relating to Edward Jenner's life. There's a flute on the chair behind me. There's books reflecting Jenner's love of knowledge and reading. We know that Jenner was interested in fossils. He was interested in natural history. He loved to sing songs, to write music. He loved art and he loved his garden as well. And from the study, he would have had a fantastic view out over the sweeping lawn, over to the churchyard of St Mary's next door. It's from this room too that Jenner would have written to the world telling them about vaccination. It's here that he encouraged people. It's here that he told them what to look out for, how to identify cases of cowpox. It's a room that really feels like he's only just stepped outside. And I think a very fitting place to end this tour of Dr. Jenner's house. I hope that you've found it interesting. I hope you've enjoyed this insight into, into what life might have been like here for Edward Jenner and why this house has such an important role, a tangible role in world history. Really look forward to talking to you further and to taking any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Owen, for that absolutely fascinating glimpse into the life and work of Edward Jenner and also for uh, telling us a little bit about the early history of vaccination. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A box from the audience. Um, one of our attendees wants to know, why is there so much concern about virus inoculation and the new kind of vaccines that are being delivered to treat COVID-19? Well, that's, that's a really good question. And, and I think that the history of um, some people call it anti-vaccination, vaccine hesitancy, or just general concerns about vaccination, it, it goes all the way back to the very start of vaccination. So with Edward Jenner, Jenner was using a, an animal virus. He was taking material from, from a cow and inserting it to humans. And there were, there were religious concerns about that for a number of different reasons, but also there were some who believed that you might become more um, bovine in nature, that you might start chewing grass or you might grow horns. And, and these are ridiculed in, in a number of different um, satirical cartoons at the time. But there were, this was just a, such a new practice. But then we still see those kind of stories today. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine um, is based on a, an adenovirus that um, 
it's more commonly associated with chimpanzees. And I know there was a, a propaganda campaign um, circulating on some parts of the internet um, many months ago that suggested if you had the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that you might turn into a into a monkey or an ape. So there, these kind of stories, uh, well, what we see as we go through the through vaccination, certainly in in Britain, there was a move to make vaccination against smallpox compulsory in the 1800s. That then prompted people who were uh, perhaps more concerned about liberty, more worried about the involvement of the state um, to start to protest this, this idea of compulsory vaccination. Uh, and so those people who were uh, perhaps more concerned with, with liberty, more interested in being able to make their own decisions, started to join forces with the people who um, had more extreme views. Uh, and then they were joined by parents who were just wanting to find out more information. There is a, I, I think in terms of, um, I, I touched on it, it briefly in, um, in, in, the, in the, the tour, um, but yeah, of course, we, we have to be mindful that, that mistrust is not just about whether it's, it's a compulsion or not, it can be in relation to who is in government, whether that government is, is an occupying power, a colonial power, and um, Sanjay Bhattacharya, who I know has given talks and, and contributed to this program, is often, I know he often says that the hand that holds the vaccine is more important than the vaccine itself. And, and I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it. And I think it's something that Edward Jenner would have been really keen to, to think about as well, because actually what we see in this country, and, and I, I don't know what the situation is with vaccine hesitancy in, in India at the moment, but um, I'm, I'd be very glad if, if, um, if someone could jump in and, and perhaps bring me up to date on that. But certainly in, in Britain, we're seeing that uh, people are wanting to have access to, to trusted medical advice. If they can't find that medical advice from their usual trusted sources, if they can't access a GP surgery, if they can't um, can't speak to to someone who, you know, a, a nurse or a, a district health worker, then they're going and asking questions online. That online now is the place that we find all of all of our information, and then people jump on and say, "Well, I heard a rumor that this happened. Well, I heard a rumor that this happened." And so much of it is rooted in these little tiny, tiny glimmers of truth. People felt that the smallpox vaccine was going to give you diseases like syphilis uh, because at the time, you know, in the early 1800s, it wasn't a sterile procedure. You were literally transferring a virus from one human to another. We're well beyond that now, but still those rumours are circulating and they start off with this grain of truth, but then they, they snowball, they spiral into something much more significant. And now with the internet, with social media, with people able to, to talk to people around the world, it's fantastic for events like this, where I can, I can talk to you wherever you are, but it does mean that information is traveling so much faster and misinformation is traveling so much faster. And I know there have been a, a number of talks as part of the Contagion exhibition series about the spread of misinformation. So vaccine rumors, started very much at the, the start of vaccination. They continue today in a very similar way. My view is that people need to be able to have conversations, need to speak to trusted advice, and that trusted advice has to be available to them. And, and ideally, we should be putting doctors, putting um, medics on that front line, getting them on social media, talking to people, rather than people turning to, to people who are perhaps more interested in spreading misinformation. Uh, and and that's, that's something that I think is, I hope governments around the world are starting to catch up with. And I hope that's something that, that is taking place now. More, co more conversations because it, it's everyone, everyone is concerned about their bodies. They're concerned about their children's bodies. More talking, more information and, um, yeah, and, and giving people space and time is, is absolutely crucial. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I believe that does. Uh, thank you so much, Owen, for that answer. And to answer your question about what vaccine hesitancy is like in India, um, 
<laughs> things aren't that great here either. But uh, we did have a panel discussion as a part of this exhibition season titled um, Unpacking COVID-19 from Evidence to Action. So we had community medicine experts and public health experts come and speak to us about the questions that people have on the ground and how they sort of um, address their queries and speak to them and how, um, you know, like you said, these questions actually arise from a place of uh, mistrust and how, why that addressing that gap in trust is important. So thank you, Owen, for that answer. And uh, we have another question from Anuj, who's curious to know whether the original inoculum has been preserved. If yes, then how? Yes, yeah, so the, the, again, um, it's a really interesting question and not one that I've been, I've been asked before. Um, so there, there's, there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of uncertainty about um, what, what that original vaccine was, what that vaccine virus was. Edward Jenner was convinced that it was, it was cowpox and he harvested lymph, um, so white blood cells, other bits of, of, um, of fluid from the blisters on, on um, a cowpox patient's hand. And he harvested that. Some of it he was able to dry, and some of it he um, inserted directly into into James Phipps. Uh, when he came to repeat his experiments, he actually had to wait um, for a couple of years because uh, cowpox. He couldn't find any cases of cowpox, so there's quite a gap in between that first vaccination and then the subsequent vaccination. Uh, and so, so Jenner himself had a, a, a vaccine supply shortage to begin with. Um, what we're what we've seen recently is there's some really fantastic scientific research going on into what what was used was it was it actually cowpox was it something that um jenna believed was cowpox but actually might have been um, a, another another pox virus and there's lots of discussion about whether it was horse pox and the way that they're trying to work that out is by taking original lancets from museum collections around the world that were used for vaccination. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a process I don't, I don't fully understand, um, but I know that there are, again, some, some interesting talks that have been, um, have been done about it that I'm sure are available on, on YouTube and around the internet. Um, they're, they're basically, they're taking fragments of DNA from the, the metal parts of the lancets and analyzing them to see what what viral DNA is there and quite often they're finding traces of of horsepox rather than cowpox suggesting that um, perhaps some people not necessarily Jenna but some people were using using horsepox at some point the um the the, the that original vaccine virus shifted to um a different type of orthopox virus called vaccinia. And vaccinia is the virus that was used in, in most, um, most of the, the later vaccines and particularly the, the freeze-dried smallpox vaccines. So yeah, I mean, ultimately they, they've, they've all, much like smallpox, um, the, the, the fact it was a live virus vaccine required the vaccine to be passed from person to person to person, keeping that virus alive and, and it's it's it absolutely blows my mind to think that when you have that last case of variola major in Rafi Babanu in, in Bangladesh that that was the end of a continuous chain of human to human transmission that started perhaps a thousand years before that two thousand years before that and just continued from person to person to person until it got to one little girl who was the last person and it didn't go beyond her uh, and so again with with that uh, i suppose thinking it thinking of it like that when you think of of the live virus used for vaccination the that original inoculation material uh, there there's a chance that it was being passed from person to person that that yeah it, it was it was it was being being used for multiple people and there are still supplies of dried smallpox vaccine um we've got quite a lot of dried smallpox vaccine in the in the museum it's it's going to have some 
similarity to, to those original vaccines being used by Jenna. Not necessarily the same because there may be the influence of horse pox, there may be a bit of cowpox in there as well. But, but to be able to find those little fragmentary traces of DNA on the lancets themselves and be able to wipe that off and, and look at what, what, what virus it was. I, I, I just think that's absolutely amazing. And I, I, as, a, as, a, as a historian um, who confesses that he doesn't really uh, know that much about science, um, I, I think that's just, it's just an absolutely fantastic thing. Um, so yes, it's preserved in fragmentary traces, um, but also in the later dried vaccines there, there will be some some mixing up of, of that material uh, that's that's not being explained in a very scientific way i'm afraid but that's a fascinating answer nonetheless Owen. thank you uh we have two questions from Iwa, and i'm just going to club them uh she asks the ch the chantry and the grounds appear to be lovely was jenna personally wealthy um what about his personal life did he have a wife and children Brilliant. Thank you for that question. And I'm really delighted to be able to talk about Jenna's personal life because it's something that we try and we try and show throughout the museum. And of course, lots of people are really interested in, in the science and the vaccination. But but yes, Jenna was a real person. And, and it's great to, to answer this from the study, which really shows Jenna's personality. Uh, he married in 1788. His wife was called Catherine. And she was the daughter of a very wealthy landowner from um, just a, a village not too far away from here. The, the story is, and we don't know, it's probably not true, but I, I love it anyway, is that Jenna wanted, he was a few years after the Montgolfier brothers had piloted their, or launched their first unmanned balloon in Paris. Jenna decided that he wanted to have a go at balloon flight. And so he created a hydrogen balloon with a friend. They launched it from the courtyard of Berkeley Castle, which is a Norman castle that's just next door to us. And they chased it on horseback and they rode across the countryside and the balloon supposedly landed at the feet of Catherine Kingscott. And Jenna got down on one knee and read a beautiful love poem to, hit, to her and they got married and happily ever after. And it's it's probably not true, but it's it's just such a lovely, lovely idea that he was he was wooing her in, in this way. But they married in 1788. They had a very happy family life. They had three children. Um, Edward, the, the eldest, was born with learning difficulties. Um, and he died at the age of 21. Robert and Catherine were, um, he had another son, Robert, who survived him, and Catherine, who also survived him. And Catherine, the mother, Catherine Jenner's wife, died of tuberculosis in 1815. It's, it's one of the really tragic parts of Jenner's life, is that if he'd been alive 100 years later, he would have been perhaps working on the tuberculosis vaccine. He would have been um, part of that, that, enterprise to to make sure that tuberculosis could be um, a vaccine preventable disease and and so for the wife of edward jenner the pioneer of vaccination to die of something that is now widely vaccine preventable is now widely treatable is is really a, a tragic part of of the story and and it's something that really um jenna um, withdrew from society at that point jenna spent more and more time here here in his study, here in, in the Chantry, it's a place that he found, he found solitude and it's a place that he, he just loved coming back to. And, and yeah, as you say, it, it is lovely. It's, it's just a beautiful place. And it's, it's so exciting to be able to share it with you because we've been closed for 14 months now. So, so this is the first time that, that our rooms, the rooms in the Chantry have been, have been on display. As for Jenna's um, wealth, yes. So this is something that we, we, we struggle to understand really because he his family had somehow come into into a bit of money he wasn't i wouldn't think that he was he was wealthy um initially anyway um his father had been vicar of barclay that was quite um, a lucrative uh job to have um so the family i think were, had a bit of a 
a bit of money, but Jenner himself was working as a, a jobbing country apothecary surgeon. It's said that when he bought the Chantry, he was perhaps going a little bit above his means to try and impress Catherine and to, more importantly, to impress Catherine's father. I think that there would have been a dowry payment given as part of the marriage. Jenna certainly in later life doesn't seem to have been short of money. If you look at his account books, he quite often forgot to charge people for, for treatment. He um, would, would give things free, free of charge. He would um, delay for a long time before requesting payment. So uh, I think even the, the medical side of his business was not something that he needed to survive. He was given two grants by the British government as well in recognition of the, the time that he spent uh, not just researching the vaccine, but also communicating it and telling it to the world. And I think that that's, for Jenner, it became a full-time job, really, in later life. He said that he would spend six hours a day here in the study, um, hunched over paper, writing to people around the world until he was um, grown as, as, I think, as tawny as whey butter and as crooked as a knife, I think was was how he described it. Um, but yeah, he he had a bit of money. I wouldn't say that he was uh, incredibly wealthy by the standards of the time, but certainly had more money than, than many of the other people in, in Berkeley. I think, that, I hope that answers the, the question. Yes, it does. Uh, we have two questions from John Matthew and um, he thanks you for the wonderful tour. And his first question is, was Jenner interested in the causative agent itself of smallpox or was the treatment and the fact that it works sufficient? A really good question again. Thank you. So many good questions. Um, so Jenner, I, he, he, he must have known that there, he does refer in his works to, to a virus, but it's generally understood that he wasn't referring to viruses as, as we know them now, not, not in the modern sense of the, or the current sense of the word. Uh, he was, I think, interested in how, how diseases occurred. I think he was, um, he was interested in understanding how things might be transferred from person to person. And I, I think that he had, he had probably a better understanding than, than others at the time, but for all we think of Jenner as being a, a, a modern medic, and I think sometimes I'm, I'm tempted to, to describe him as being this, this pioneering, forward-thinking 21st century man in the, in, the 17th, in the 18th century, but he was still very tied to these Galenic theories of, of medicine. His um, prescriptions are all for, for herbal relief and concoctions and potions and things like that. So I think he was still perhaps in of that, that, fr that frame of mind, that mindset of we found a way of stopping it. That is really, this works, let's, let's just go with it and, and let's run with it. Um, but I think as well, he, he had one thing that I found really interesting is that he had, I think, again, I don't know whether it's it's reading a modern perspective into it. And I think that's something that we have to be really careful with with Jenner. But the opening lines of his inquiry, his publication, um, state that mankind's intervention in the natural world has lined us up for, for more diseases than we might otherwise expect to occur. And, and I think that's, he saw cowpox as being something that really was only, only being passed to humans because of the, the need for farming, the desire to, um, to come into close contact with cattle for the purposes of milking them and, and pretending to them. And, and I've, I've seen a few people recently have, have suggested that actually our, humanity's destructive tendencies are, are deforestation activities. The fact that we are spreading further and further and further into, into nature, we're really taking over parts of land that has not been inhabited for ever. That in itself is, is going to be a trigger for further 
further diseases and, and perhaps further pandemics. And I think that that's quite interesting seeing, seeing Jenna's understanding of, of that, that encroachment into the natural world as being a cause of disease that perhaps is a bit different from, from others of his day who, um, you know, I, I, said, I said in the tour, understandings of smallpox were that it was something that existed inside of you and had to, had to force its way out, hence the pustules, or that it was just bad, bad odours in the air, which not too far from the truth, but still not, not that modern understanding. But, but yeah, so Jenna in, in many ways was, I think, I think, I think he could have gone further. Um, uh, probably he, he could have gone further and I think could have made some, some further jumps, but I think he was also quite satisfied to, to continue focusing on how to refine the process to identifying this is exactly what cowpox is, whereas this is smallpox, do not use that and, and things like that. Right, so uh, the second question from John Matthews is, um, how much did the success of the ring program for smallpox extend to other viral diseases, uh, not least pandemics, after the 1960s, and with what level of success? I'm going to I'm going to have to say that that is not um, that's not something I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I think that might be a bit beyond uh, <laughs> beyond beyond me, but um, certainly. The, you, you can see that it, it, it is, it, it's, it's about, in, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll answer a different question so I have something to say, um, but it, it's, it's that integrated public health system, isn't it? It's the, it's the need to have, um, have the surveillance, the tracking, the ability to identify cases, the ability to test for cases alongside vaccination. But, it's been said, I think, so many times over the last year that there is no silver bullet. There's no one magic solution. And I think that perhaps some people have said, well, if we vaccinate everyone, it will be OK. If we isolate everyone, if we quarantine, if we lock down, it will be OK. And it has to be all of those things. It, it has to be a combination of various different tried and tested public health methods. One thing that I find interesting is that in the, um, the 19th century in Britain, uh, there was a, a particular, um, there were some towns and cities that were particular cases of particular um, hotbeds of anti-vaccination um, campaigners, anti-vaccination sentiment. One of them was the, the town, the borough of Leicester. And, so faced with um, a, the, a series of magistrates who wouldn't enforce the vaccination rules, the need to be need for everyone to be vaccinated, faced with citizens who weren't concerned about whether they were put in prison or fined or punished for failing to have their children vaccinated, the medical officers of Leicester realised that actually they couldn't just get away with attempting to vaccinate everyone. They had to look at other ways and so they they adopted something they called the Leicester method which was basically a, 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 a track and trace system a test and trace system where they were identifying cases of smallpox they were removing them from the from the town they were quarantining them in an isolation hospital they were burning bedding because they knew that that would be that was essential to to destroy the or to stop the spread they were isolating um, their contacts, they were trying to find their contacts and, and making sure that they're isolated. And people often say, we see it a lot in, in a lot of the anti-vaccination literature, well, smallpox was eradicated in Leicester without vaccination, people weren't getting vaccinated, uh, and therefore that shows that the Leicester method was working. But they forget that the Leicester method had one really crucial thing, which is that health workers were vaccinated. So the people caring for the patients in smallpox hospitals were vaccinated and therefore they weren't taking smallpox home, home with them. They were safe from smallpox. They could come into close contact with their patients. So I think that's a real, real example of, of how integrated health systems are, are, are so important. Investment in health systems is so important. 
and and I think that that was something that was really realized through the, the ring vaccination program through identifying cases through working with other other villages other towns to try and make sure that the contacts were traced I think that some of those lessons have been learnt, um, and I think that we are starting to see that but with smallpox as well there, there is as well the, the fact that smallpox has no animal reservoir and it was it's something that relied on that person-to-person -person contact so the ring method doesn't necessarily work for you, you th there are some diseases where where it will be very difficult to eradicate particularly through through a ring method because because they have other hosts um, and they spread in different ways their smallpox as well was very um very obvious if you had smallpox um, and it could be could be identified you could quarantine some whereas something like covid19 where you're looking at asymptomatic transmission where you're looking at maybe it's a third of people haven't don't realize they have it uh so so yeah i think i think that the need for integrated health systems is something that that has been i think is gradually being realized i hope is being gradually realized um but also there there is a consensus that that the ring system would not necessarily work with every disease and that smallpox really was an ideal candidate for for eradication thank you owen um, for answering all our questions so generously and for also giving us a tour of dr jenner's house and the grounds it's an honor and a privilege to be able to i mean to be a uh, uh, to be taken on a tour of this um, space, which hasn't been open to the public for the past 14 months. And it's also an honor and a privilege for us to partner with you on our exhibition season. So thank you so much, Owen. Um, thank you all for uh, attending this tour. If you enjoyed it and want to share it with your um, friends and close ones, please do uh, check out our YouTube channel. My colleagues will drop a link in the chat box and share uh, the event with your networks. We have the recordings of all our previous lectures and events on our YouTube channel as well. So don't forget to check that out. Um, today is the last day of uh, the first phase of Contagion. So our closing event is at 6.30 p.m. We have a lecture by uh, the director of the Wellcome Trust, Sir Jeremy Farrar, who will speak about science, innovation and society and what we have learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. So we hope to see many of you there. Um, tonight is also the last night that we have the exhibit, a cluster of 17 cases uh, by the British artist group Blast Theory. And this exhibit is fascinating because it explores the events that took place in the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, where the first cluster of SARS cases were detected in 2003. So uh, don't forget to check that out. And we will also be um, removing the films which are a part of our exhibition season, uh, A Human Question, Disease Survivors, The Peribig Maker, and Where Birds Dance Their Last, all are fascinating films. Some of them are one of it is an animation film, the other is a documentary, and it uh, explores the impact of contagion on communities around the world. So don't forget to take a look at that. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Owen, for this wonderful tour. And if you enjoyed this session, please do leave us your feedback so we know what worked well for you and what we could do better going forward. Uh, stay safe and have a restful Sunday. See you at our future programs. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye.